Hello everyone, in this video I'll be showing my thoughts on the second episode of Season 8 of The Walking Dead The Damned. There will be spoilers for the entire episode throughout this video, so I suggest you only watch this after viewing the latest instalment of The Walking Dead first. Anyway, without further ado, let's begin. The Damned follows up on last week's high octane season opener by delivering another explosive hour of television. The episode centres on Rick and Co splitting into four different groups, with each group leading an attack on the saviours in some form or another. Firstly, I want to begin this review by applauding the showrunners for not stretching out the featured battles over four separate episodes. Everyone knows that one of my major nitpicks with The Walking Dead during the last couple of years in particular has been its persistent desire to stick with only one group of characters each week, causing viewers to spend large periods of time away from their favourite cast members. Luckily, the creative team behind the series decided to buck the trend for this entry in the franchise, which in turn made for a much more exciting viewing experience than if we were just following one group an episode for the next month. An awful lot happened over the course of the dam's runtime, so I feel the best way to do this review is to focus on one group of characters at a time. And with that in mind, I'll start off by discussing the group that contains Tara, Morgan and Jesus. Much like Rick's attack on the Saviour compound back in Season 6, Team Morgan's plan involved attacking a Saviour base using stealthy means, such as using a bow and arrow to take out patrolling guards on the outside, and silence pistols to take out those stationed inside. However, with this being The Walking Dead, things can never be that easy. Once inside, Tara and Jesus come into contact with a dude doing his best impression of Otacon from Metal Gear Solid, who pisses himself hiding from the ongoing assault in a cupboard. Tara wanted to blow his brains in, whilst Jesus, much like his namesake, preached the message of peace instead. The guy in the cupboard said he was just a worker and not a soldier, which caused an issue as to what Tara and Jesus should do with him. So far the saviours have mostly been portrayed as dumb generic bad guys, so it was nice to see an average Joe with a family who didn't want to work for Negan but had no other option. Oh no wait hang on this guy is just another cackling baddie as well. His worker story was just all an act, well that's kind of disappointing. I was hoping to see a more human side of the saviours, I mean surely not all of them can be mini Negan wannabes. Despite this revelation somewhat souring the effect of this encounter for me, I did like the fact that even when Jesus found out Mr Pissy Pants' true intentions, he still captured him, and in fact goes on to capture the entire group of saviours who surrender at the compound. I feel that there needs to be some kind of moral compass on the show, and I'm glad that Jesus has taken it onto his shoulders to suggest an alternative to Rick's kill them all mentality. Morgan was also along for the ride with Jesus and Tara, and in fact nearly got himself killed when he and two hilltop members got more than they bargained for when attempting to breach a door. Sadly, the hilltop members didn't survive, and when Morgan arrived from his slumber he turned into the Terminator, charging through the dark corridors killing anyone that got in his way. Everyone knows that I love Crazy Morgan, and this was another badass scene that I adored. After he had his fill of killing everyone in the base, he met up with the previously mentioned Jesus and Tara outside just as they had got the saviours to surrender. For me the moment in which Morgan stood still with thoughts of good and evil racing around his brain was one of the tensest moments in the episode. I honestly thought he was going to mess up the entire situation by opening fire on everyone, but somehow he managed to show incredible restraint in not doing so, especially seeing as he came into contact with this particularly nasty saviour who's killed Ben. I mean to be honest, I want to see him dead, so Morgan did well to regain his cool. Moving away from Team Morgan and onto Team Aaron now. Aaron found himself tasked with leading another group which consisted of the likes of Tobin, Eric and other expendable cast members to take out another saviour outpost. The group rolled up in the armoured cars used in last week's instalment, and spent a decent length of time firing wildly at the saviours without ever really gaining any ground. However, this was all part of the plan, as the group knew that if they could down enough saviours they would eventually turn and take out the remaining crew. All in all, it's a pretty clever strategy, however it does rely on a lot of what ifs. I mean, what if Aaron and his people shot too many saviours in the head, meaning they wouldn't turn? Or what if the dead saviours simply took too long to turn and didn't make an impact on the battle at all? The plan does get more sensical when you examine it under a deeper light, but I'm willing to let it slide, because as far as Walking Dead plans goes, there have been a lot worse. There were also a couple of deaths during this sequence in which a few Alexandrian extras died, and Eric appears to be knocking at death's door after suffering a gun wound. I did find it nice that this episode didn't shy away from the horrors of war, something that I'll discuss more when I get to Rick and Daryl later. Moving on, the third group was headed by Carol and Ezekiel, and this was in my mind the weakest story arc this episode. Carol and the King spent their time tracking down a saviour who was on the run after escaping their clutches during the last episode, 
and to be honest, not an awful lot really happened. In a way, I suppose it was nice to have some moments of quiet in amongst the chaos, however every time the focus shifted to the Kingdom Soldiers, in all honesty I just wanted to switch back to following one of the other teams. Last but not least were Rick and Daryl who were on the hunt for some more guns. I thought that as always Andrew Lincoln was superb, and although Daryl wasn't given an awful lot to do, it's always nice to see him and Rick together. It was also interesting to see evidence of more prisoners kept by the saviours, reminding us all of when poor Daryl was subjected to Easy Street on repeat. Now you've all probably got Easy Street playing in your heads, I really am sorry. Rick's fight against the unarmed saviour was brutal and made for nail-biting viewing. It reminded me a bit of when Rick strangled the claimer to death in the bathroom, and a disgusting way in which he impaled a dude's head on a coat hanger was classic Rick Grimes. I mentioned previously how sometimes it's hard to root for Rick when he's just going around killing whoever he sees fit without a care in the world. So it was nice to see him reflect on what he had become when entering little Gracie's room. Rick had more than likely just made this little girl an orphan, and it made for a powerful scene witnessing Rick stare into a mirror covered in blood, on the verge of breaking down after realising what truly horrible things he was now doing on a regular basis. One gripe I have with this scene however, is the fact that Rick just left the kid in the cot. I mean I understand that it was a bit of a dangerous place to be walking around with a baby, and I also acknowledge that the last thing Rick needs right now is another baby to look after, but it kind of felt like Rick was just leaving the poor baby to die. In all fairness, I don't think this was how the scene was intended to play out, but seeing as the entire house seemed to be pretty empty, combined with the fact that Daryl and Rick had killed most of the people they encountered in there, there's no guarantee that she will be found at all, and it just seems weird for Rick to leave a lonely baby on its own. The last thing I want to talk about is the return of Season 1's Morales. I acknowledge that the door has always been open for a return since he left the show as his character didn't die, but I have to say I was not expecting this at all. I've seen some on the internet saying it's a bit dumb that somehow he ended up with Negan, but I'm going to reserve judgement until we actually hear his story about what happened. And we will hear his story because despite the ending there's no way he's going to pull the trigger on Rick. I think The Walking Dead does get a lot of flack when it comes to cliffhanger endings, and some of the time it is deserved. But rather than being on par with Negan killing the cameraman in Season 6, this cliffhanger had more in common with Rick hearing the phone ring in Season 3. And what I mean by that is that instead of making me lose interest in the show, this ending makes me want to watch more and find out what happened. I can honestly say that I can't wait to see how Rick's encounter with Morales will pan out next week. To summarise, The Damned kept up the fast paced momentum of the season opener and managed to build on that solid platform and delivered an even better episode this time around. By switching back and forth between different character groups the pacing remained at a breakneck speed and my interest never waned. As always there were a few notable issues but on the whole this was one of the most enjoyable and exciting episodes for quite some time with an ending that only makes me wish the next instalment would come around sooner. So there you have it, my review of the latest instalment of The Walking Dead. As always, please let me know your thoughts below, and until next time, thank you for watching, and goodbye.